What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. Adam, I want to start with the Lakers series, though, because a really interesting thing happened to me uh, as a fan. That's the one team that I have a little bit of a, of a fan rooting interest in. You know, going into that series, I did not think they had a real chance. Like there was always like that tiny little chance, you know, like the if things break right yeah. and everybody plays out of their mind, you have that chance. But like I never really believed and I didn't believe in game one, didn't believe in game two when they were up 20, didn't believe in game three when they led at the half, didn't believe in game four when they won. But there was a brief moment in game five. I wouldn't have picked the Lakers just because it's really difficult to beat a good team four times in a row under any circumstances, let alone when they have the best player in the world and they're the defending champ. But there was a brief moment in game five where I felt like the Lakers were starting to gain some ground mentally and physically. They started to feel more confident in the matchup and they had kind of figured out what their advantages were. And, and obviously through the KCP ankle injury and Jamal Murray's calf, it just felt like the Lakers were starting to gain some ground and I thought that they went from having a tiny chance to like an actually acknowledgeable chance. So my, am I just being a crazy fan or you, did you feel a similar type of trend over the course of that series? And again, not saying the Lakers would have won, but went from very unlikely to at least having some sort of opportunity there. Well, I think what you're hinting at here is Denver didn't look good. And I think the one thing that we always have to remember in a series is that there's always one team that's more urgent. Denver never felt urgency in the series outside of maybe the second half of game two, when I think they let the game get a little too far out of hand and then by the skin of their teeth made it back. But in game five, I just thought Denver, and it really through the whole series, I thought Denver took the Lakers very lightly. They seemed bored with the series. And I think the team, um, you know, projected that I'll, I'll say, I don't think anybody on the record came out and said, Hey, I think that this is a series that Denver had a hard time getting through, but that was the sense I got. So if they lost that game and you have to go, on the road back to Los Angeles, does that mean they would muster up the energy like, okay, let's all lean forward now, let's get into it? Or is that one that maybe would have taken the wind out of the sail? I don't know. What I will say is that I thought Anthony Davis was very comfortable scoring on Jokic in that series. Jokic never really solved that. Uh, and then Jamal Murray was banged up, clearly did not play well in any of the uh, games in the series, save for the fourth quarters of games two and game five. So I think you look at that, and it's easy for me to say I think the Nuggets had another gear that they have not tapped into, and that'll be a storyline as we move on to the next series. But at the same time, Denver looked tired, Murray looked banged up, and I think they were very happy to get that series done when they did. Yeah, you know, I I said the same thing after Game 4. I was like, Denver has not had urgency, meaning like they were, I, I felt like they were approaching the series with a certain level of professionalism, like they were given their 85-90% effort, but... Again, when you beat a team that many times in a row, it's impossible to feel threatened. And there's also no way to replicate like true urgency, which I, I look at it like an actual fear of losing, right? That that was what was interesting me to me about game five, though, is like it felt like a game the Nuggets kind of needed, but the Lakers were able to kind of remain competitive throughout. At the end of the day, though, like I thought there was one specific thing that prevented me from ever really believing the Lakers had a real chance and it had to do with perimeter defense, which I think is going to be interesting as we get into the, the Timberwolves series. But during the regular season, the Lakers had like a 194, I think, defensive rating in the clutch against Denver. They were scoring like every time down the floor. And then game two came around and they scored on eight of their final nine possessions, right? And like, then we get into game five. And once again, it was like at the end of the game, it was like another Jamal Murray driving layup in pick and roll. Another pull-up jumper uh, 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 to, to win the game. Obviously, he hit a three on an offensive rebound put back or offensive rebound at the end of the game too. It, to me, it really came down to the Lakers never had a guy who could guard Jamal well. Like, I think Austin did his job within the game plan, but he just didn't have the physical tools necessary to really make Jamal uncomfortable. And then the matchup that killed us all series was that Michael Porter Jr. matchup. And again, that part of that's roster construction. Like, when you roll out two forwards at the three and four that can't navigate screens, you're going to run into issues with, with MPJ kind of running off of screens. It wasn't just Rui either. LeBron lost him 
a few times in the series as well. But like that, that to me was where that matchup went south for the Lakers. Ironically, when we go into the next round, like I view Denver, as, I, I view Minnesota as a much tougher defensive matchup for Denver, but a much easier offensive matchup. I think some of the damage that the Lakers did to the Nuggets in the paint had a lot to do with not just LeBron and AD as rollers, but their IQ and read and react ability on that back line. Like, I just don't think you're going to get that from Gobert and Towns in this series. And so did, did, did you kind of like get a similar sense where like some of the unique ability of LeBron and AD as a front court duo caused some problems for Denver that other teams in the league just can't? There's no question. And the team themselves reiterated that after the series. I mean, Jamal Murray, I don't know if you saw his post-game presser after game five. He was as impressed with LeBron as I was. He talked about how he was one of his favorite players growing up. And then he just kept saying, he makes you think every play. Well, you're out there. You're just constantly having to think through. And I, look, they were a seven seed. Their roster was flawed. They, they, it wasn't like they were a phenomenal all-around team. But I just think there's a reason LeBron has only lost, what, 11 playoff series or something in his entire career. He's got 80 and 11 or something all the time. He's so good in the playoffs, and even with that roster, he just puts so much pressure on you. And then Anthony Davis had his jump shot going. I think he was very confident against Jokic. I, it's funny because Jokic's numbers are tremendous. I thought he did a great job against Jokic. One of the best jobs we've seen, you know, on both ends, putting pressure on him on offense. And then defensively, obviously, they did that quick double. But in the moments when he was one on one, he made life difficult on Jokic. So I, I 100% agree that I think those two guys um, did a great job. I think the Lakers are better than people probably will give them credit for. And just like last year, the series was probably closer than the five games would, would indicate. But at the same time, Denver has been doing this now for two years with this core five. And for seven years with that core too, Murray and Jokic, they have so many reps. It's hard to, it's hard, I think, for people to wrap their heads around how many reps that unit has together, how they've seen everything. And both game winners, Jason, came with no timeout. It's, it, it's no small detail. And then if you look at all the details in those plays, all the little things guys did, where they got onto the court, that was a team that if you called a timeout, most teams, if you call a timeout and draw up that exact action, they would not be able to execute it with the subtleties that Denver did. And they did that with no timeout. And that's what makes them special. So when they win all these games close, to me, there's a level of luck involved naturally. It's just math. You know, short 10 possessions is not that many. So ball bounces your way. It makes a huge difference. But there's something to Denver that I say, it's not all luck. And it's not all variance. That team just does every detail right in those moments. And it's why they're the best clutch team. Yeah, when year. you brought up the seven years, I immediately thought about Malone's comments after game five, like trust the best two-man game in the league. Like, because it's, it's just a certain level of, like it, it almost is instinctual for the two of them after all this time. And like last note on the Lakers before we move on, like I, I there's going to be a lot of uh, moments at their expense. First round exit. They both of them talked about how they wanted Denver again. One thing I'll say though, I think LeBron and AD put their money where their mouth was like a Jokic kicked AD's ass last year and Jamal soundly outplayed LeBron. I thought AD closed the gap a little bit. Uh, obviously didn't surpass yeah. him, but he closed the gap a little bit. And I thought LeBron actually outside of the clutch shooting was a better player in this series than Jamal Murray. So like shout out to them. But like at the end of the day, it actually just shined a giant light on the chasm between the down the roster competence. And like, again, like it, it, I, I think it's actually fascinating that the Lakers went about a bizarre roster build with two skill guards and two big forwards instead of having a natural two and a natural three. And who were the two guys who let them down in the biggest way in the series? It was the second skill guard and the second big forward, Rui and D'Lo. And I thought that was fascinating. So like in a weird way, it was like I was proud of the Lakers. I was proud of LeBron and AD, but it was like very revealing as to why there's a gap between these two teams and what they need to address moving forward. 